that's fellowship's sake. How many of you have ever gone shopping on Black Friday? Okay. How many have ever gone shopping in the mall during Christmas season? Okay, a little more hands. How many of you have ever had pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving? Apple pie at Thanksgiving. Cherry pie at Thanksgiving. Turkey at Thanksgiving. Stuffing at So we've done it. How many of you ever, as a kid, you were, you know, you went and saw Santa Claus in, in a mall or a store or whatever? How many of you have ever, I don't know, had to try, you know, um, fruit uh, fruitcake at one time or another? How many of you will never eat fruitcake again because of the connotation of what it stands for? <laughs> right. So, so a lot of times we, we, we've, we've, there's tradition towards it, and it's kind of like there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, have, there's a lot of us have tried meatloaf or have eaten meatloaf, and some people have salads or have chicken on every time you turn around. So there's nothing new that I can preach to you that you have never heard before. And if, if that's so, it's probably not anything worthwhile preaching. So having said that, let's go back to the well and preach from the same things we already know. So the conquering Christ. I'm going I'm to come at it from four points. One is the faithless faithful, the, the failing followers, the flailing followers, the father's follow through, and finalizing the footstool was my four points. And they're alliterated. It took me some time to figure those things out, but I got them down. So obviously the first we look for is the faithless faithful. Here they are early in the morning. It says in verse 1, they came and they come, and they might, uh, they're, they're on their way that they might un, uh, come and anoint him. So here they are, they're very early in the, in the morning, the first day of the week after the Passover. Verse number, uh, verse number 9 says that, the first early, risen early the first day of the week. So we see this is a very early morning, the first day of the week. By the way, when you look at the book of Mark, and you know, look at the, ch- the 16th chapter, I should say, verses 1 through 8, Tells the story and short version. And then verses 9 through the rest of the chapter kind of gives it long order, kind of gives it a little more detail. There are a lot of skeptics out there who say that modern translators, modern translators, and modern Bible readers, and things like that, and also it was taken out of the site, the Sinaitic, the Codex S. What they're trying to say is this didn't belong in the Bible. Like, there was, this was added on. It doesn't need to be. It was never found anywhere else in there. And so they tried taking Mark chapter Mark 9, or Mark 16, verses 9 through 20, and say it was added to Scripture. Now, here's the thing. I don't know for sure if it was. I, I can't sit there and argue and debate back and forth with these people. I'm not going to. I'm not going to study Greek. I'm not going to study Hebrew. I'm not going to study Latin. I'm not going to go try digging up the, you know, on a temple quest to find the, you know, Raiders of the Lost of the Lost, of the lost Ark. I'm not going to go and try finding the the Dead Sea Scrolls. We're trying to go on an archaeological dig to find out proof of this. I'm going to take God's word at what it is. I believe it belongs in the Bible because it's in the Bible, but also because it's supported by the other Gospels. It's supported by by Matthew, by Luke. The Synoptic Gospels is added to it of what's being said, and they share the same information that Mark is get that Mark is giving us in these passages. So scripture always supports scripture. Having said that, there are people who like to say that this verse doesn't belong or that doesn't belong. First John 5 7 doesn't belong in the Bible. First John 5 8 doesn't belong in the Bible because it just it's not clear. There's added in it's in italics, blah 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 blah. I believe that what we have today is the inspired, preserved, inerrant, infallible, perfect word of God in English language, and it's right here in the King James Bible. Does it exist in other languages? Sure it does. I don't speak other languages. I speak English, and this is the Bible that I can know, guarantee that I can hold up saying, this is for me. I am for the KJV, and the KJV is for me, right? I believe the Word of God is there written for us. So, having said that, it's going to this verse. Number one, it says that they, they came to anoint Christ. They came to do this. But if you remember, Christ was already anointed. And this is where I'm going to get the idea of the faithless Faithful. There are people who were faithful in doing what they knew to do. Sundays, Wednesdays, going soul winning, doing, going. Every, they went about preaching the gospel, of the kingdom, everywhere they went. They did. They obeyed the Lord. They preached the coming of the Lord. They did everything they were supposed to do. But yet, sometimes they they were faithless. And Christ even called them faithless. Christ even said, "Oh, you faithless generation! Like, what is wrong with you? Why don't every time you see Christ going at it? In fact, later on in this passage." He upbraids them with their unbelief. He kind of tells them, you didn't believe. He kind of jives to them and pokes at them and, and rides their unbelief. 
So I believe you're looking at this passage, and I believe you have to remember Jesus is already anointed, and they they forgot they forgot about that. So Mark chapter number Mark chapter number fourteen, and look what it says in verse number three. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment, it's of spikenard, very precious, and she break the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation with themselves and said, Why what why was this waste of the ointment made? For it had been for it might have been sold for more than three hundred pence, and have been given to the poor, and they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for for ye have the poor with you always, and when so, and whensoever you will you will, you may do to them good, but me you have not always. She hath done what she she has done what she could. She has come aforehand to what? Anoint my body to the burying. So this was just not too very long ago that this 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 remembrance came through, but they didn't believe it. There's a lot of times we come to the Bible and we come across something where we're like, hey, wait a second now. This is kind of seems far-fetched. And you may believe the Lord, you may get saved, you may have the Lord as your Savior, you may you're trusting him as your Savior, but there still comes a place where your faith, you're, you're faithless. Or you're faithless, where you're, you're lacking faith in that area. Or you're not to the full maturity of, of understanding. Or there may be, and it's not saying you're immature like you like cartoons 24-7. By the way, nothing's wrong with that. Because cartoons are actually made for adults. Defense, seriously, though, we get to this place where we like put up walls of defense. And we don't actually believe something full-fledged. And instead of studying it and intermingling with all wisdom and intermeddle with with wisdom, like the Bible says in Proverbs, we just dismiss it right off the top. And instead of being mature about it and thinking about it and dissecting it and studying it out to find out whether these things are so, we quickly either just accept it blindly or we just refuse it just bluntly. We just refuse it saying, you know what, it can't be so. It's just stupid. I didn't, it's stupid. And even if facts come through to it, or proof comes into it, or a deeper understanding comes to it, we automatically put up walls saying, no, it can't be true. Well, did you study it out? Have we done due diligence to study this thing out? With any doctrine, with any thought, with anything there is, have we done due diligence? There's so many things that's coming out, that's coming out of the woodworks and destroying that people. Some stuff, it's beyond, like it's old. Like, you know, old hat. Like one of the things... That's come out recently is this idea that Daniel chapter number nine is messianic. And I've never heard that before. I've never heard it. I'd be foolish to sit there and say, ah, oh, it's hogwash. Well, how do I, why? Because someone told me it was hogwash? Because someone told me it was foolish? Because someone told me it was false, it was false doctrine? Or is it to my responsibility? Is it up to me to study the word of God? It's of my responsibility to study, to show myself approved, Unto God, a workman. It's my responsibility. Hey, you know what? And it may come out to be hogwash. It came out. To, it may come out to be 100% false. But it's my responsibility to study that out. It's not my responsibility to rely on the pastor or to rely on this other guy that I saw on the internet or this other guy in the church or what I've ever heard or some commentary on the bookshelf. It's my responsibility to pick it apart and study it. That's my responsibility. But if I blindly follow it, or if I blindly dismiss it, it's faithless. It's faithless. So you find here that they first, they came to anoint the body, but it was already anointed, and they remembered it not. The festivities festivities were over, the Passover was passed, and they came to anoint the body after the fact. Remember now, Christ was crucified. He was was as the Passover lamb, right? And they crucified him. They They took him off the cross quickly because of the Passover, they didn't want anybody dying on the Passover, so they took him off the cross quickly after he died. They wrapped him up, they put him in a borrowed tomb in Joseph of Armia, in Joseph of Armia, Joseph's tomb. There we go. Slow down. And they wrapped him up, put him in the tomb, and then three days later, they're going to go back and they're going to anoint him. But in between that time of putting him in that tomb, the chief priests have called for Pilate to put a stone, a great stone, across the front of that door and to put a guard and to seal it. Like triple lock. I mean, there it goes. Safety lock 100%. I mean, that thing is not going anywhere. And then as they're now, these ladies are getting up early in the morning to go anoint the body of Christ three days after the fact. Right? Three days after the fact. 
And now they're going to go into another body. Well, some things are just beyond. It's now it's just formalism. After three days, the body stinks. After four days, you stink it by now, right? Because the Bible says it was Lazarus. After four days, it stink it. You're on that. You're on that place right now where it's like his body is going to start decaying, and because in their mind he's still dead, and their and their remembrance is he's still gone. But their plan was was just faulty. They went out. They went out with a purpose, but their purpose wasn't thought out. It was out of formalism. I was out of. I uh, was out of, um, it wasn't their, their true sincerity. And they get halfway there, they're like, hey, wait a second. Who's going to roll away the stone? Uh, if it, you thought about this, they woke up a great while before day, right? The Bible says they rose up early in the morning. The first day of the week, they, they, grow, they went up first day of the week. They went out, and they go out to anoint this body, and yet the stone, the stone is still there. The soldiers said, they're not the seal. Who's going to roll the stone away? Their plan was to get up and anoint the body of Christ, but they didn't think things through like, hey, bring help to roll the stone. You see what I'm saying? Like they're 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 they had high motives, they had high they had thoughtful motives, things of appreciation. Surely this would honor their loved their beloved Lord, their beloved their beloved teacher, who is gone on now. But he's still in that tomb, and who's gonna roll away the tomb so we can anoint his body? So they they even though they believe, even though the Bible says they believe that he was in resurrection and life, John 11, they still forgot this very fact that, hey, there's still a stone. So they're, they're faithless. Even in what they believe, they didn't believe it. Even as they, they went out and, they, and he, they, they, he cast out demons, they cast out devils, they, they healed the sick, they preached the gospel of the kingdom. Many believed on him and they said that, hey, thou art, some are lies, some is John the Baptist, some are some other prophet. But then, when Jesus sends them across the sea and a storm comes, they're of no faith. Well, they're of little faith. And they're afraid. And it's because they're faithless, faithful. They're, they're consistent. They're, they're doing what they know to do, but yet they're faithless. And there's things that in our life we have to make sure we do the same thing. Can God do what he says he's going to do? There's times in our life we seriously doubt that, don't we? Which is why we operate in the flesh. Which is why we choose to do things fleshly. Which is why we find ourselves unfaithful at times, or or lacking consistency in our in our daily life, not even just in service, but in our daily life. Hey, how long has it been since we actually opened up the Word of God and actually read the Word of God out of sincerity, or how is it just mostly because we want to read our Bible? We got to do it. It's 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 a rut. It's it's like it's a it's, it's a routine. We have to do it. It's just what I do. Well, great. Well, when was the last time you had sincerity? Where you actually, in sincerity, went to the Word of God to glean something and apply it to your life then and there like it was the brand newest thing when you first got saved. It's been a while because we're faithless. And we have to develop that. We have to encourage it. These are the same people who walked with Jesus for three years. And yet they're faithless. We know this because we find out, we find out later on that Christ abraded them, the disciples, with their unbelief. So if there's a faithless faithful. But yet how he loved, but yet how much they loved Christ. They truly did love Christ. Remember John 11 when Jesus goes to uh, Lazarus' tomb and he calls for the stone to be rolled away and he, and he goes in and looks in and the Bible says that he, he, he wept, Jesus wept. And then they sat around and they saw him do this. They said, oh, how he loved him. These people honestly loved Christ and they came for the burial. They came, he, they came to anoint the body. It wasn't like a passive, oh, I guess I have to go put flowers in the grave. They were doing it out of respect. They're going to anoint the body for burial. And their sincerity, but their sincerity was was futile because of their faithlessness. Doesn't mean they weren't saved. They were just faithlessness. They were doing something out of routine, something out of ritual, something out of tradition, but not out of sincerity of heart. Not out of truth. Number two, the flailing followers. Look what it says here in verse. So obviously they see the stone, the great the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering to the sepulchre, they saw a young man, verse 5, sitting on the right hand, on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Points him out. Say, you remember? This is where Joseph laid his body. This is where he was. Can you imagine pointing out, here is the place where he laid. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. 
there shall ye see him as he said unto you. Look at verse 8. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither, neither, if it, now you read it, said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Here you find the flailing followers. Here it was, I mean, could you imagine taking it in? Like, here you are, like, you know he said he was going to rise again. And he rose again. And even then, Mary Magdalene sits back and says, hey, just show me where you've taken him. Just show me where you've laid him. Show me where he was. Now, they believed on his death, burial, resurrection. We find that all through Scripture. We find that all the way through his through the Gospels where they believed he was a resurrection and a life. They, they, Jesus told them. Jesus told them they believed on him that he was going to rise again. And even Matthew chapter 24, when he's asking for the signs of the last, of the last times, he says, when shall these things be in, in thy coming? They, they believe that Christ was not just going to die and that was going to be the end of the story. They believed in the resurrection. They believed in this. But yet now, the resurrection has taken place and they're just beside themselves. Like, what am I going to do? Like, You know, we see loved ones die. Loved ones die and it's like, oh, it's just heartbreaking. Our heart mourned. We still, there's some people in my life, I, my mom died uh, back 20, you know, how many years ago? 21, 22 years ago. And my heart still breaks. I can still think of my mom. I'm like, man, I, I think my mom would have really liked to see my family. I think my mom would have really liked to see the girls. I think my mom would have absolutely loved the, the craziness they bring to the table. I think they really would. I think that's, my mom would really like to see that. And it breaks my heart thinking about my mom. And I'm so glad she's not suffering anymore. I'm so glad God took her out of the sin-cursed world. I know I'm going to see her again, but oh, how my heart is is heavy. And that's why Jesus says, hey, be not, you know, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, right? He's trying to console them and remind them of this. Hey, look at I'm coming again. You know, it's, it's going to be okay. So having said that, though, they're, they're flailing. It's not that they're failing. They're flailing. They're trying. They're, they don't know what to do. They're just literally concussed. They don't know what to do. They're just kind of like flapping their arms. They don't know how to swim. They're just like, their mind is just, they're just, ugh! and they're literally just flailing out in all types of hope. First thing you see is they were insecure. They were affrighted. Here's a heavenly messenger. Here it is, an angel, and they're affrighted. They're afraid. I mean, did they not see Christ? The Bible says in John that we, that we beheld him. We saw we saw God. We, we touched him. We, we handled him. The truth. First John tells us that we've handled the word of life. We've seen him. It was like not he was full of grace and truth, John chapter one. It wasn't like this we have no idea who this guy was. It was held in earthen vessels. They saw the glory of God. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So he's pointing out they, they, they saw this brilliancy of him, but now you see an angel that is made less than than what God is in all his glory, right? But yet he's higher than man, right? Because I've made him a little more than angels. But here you see the heavenly messenger, and they're just like now they're frightened. They see this guy. Now, some Gospels in the Gospel message says there is two. Okay? But here's the thing. People say, oh, let's see, there's a contradiction. Was there one or two? Was there one or two? There were two. But here they saw one. It doesn't mean that they it, their, their attention was on one. It doesn't mean that there is not two. It just means their attention was on one. And later on you see John, there was two. Matthew, there was two. John, Luke, there was two. But he sees this and he's like, Wow, like they're seeing one young man, and it's because they're they're just they're just they're totally discombobulated. They're flailing. They're, they're Messiah. They're they're the one they were putting their trust in was just crucified, and it wasn't like some oh got crucified oh tra- tragic accident. This was a execution. This was an end to an insurrection. They tried blaming an insurrection on Christ. We're still talking about the capital insurrection. Right? We're still talking about what happened January 6th. And we're still having investigations and still finding lynch mobs. And still, this, this wasn't just a, like a drop in the pan. We remember when America was at war itself against 9-11. Right? We still talk about that. And all the conspiracies and cover-ups. This is three days removed from this public execution of this great person who had done nothing against anyone 
The only thing he possibly did was a loose accusation that he said he was going to destroy the temple. But then he actually went back and said, no, he was talking about his body. So even when their lies didn't even mash up, they still put him to death. It was a great big conspiracy and execution, public execution. And could you imagine being part of them? Being part is labeled with Christ, and they're just flailing. Like, what do I do? Oh my goodness, they're coming after me next. What do I do? The Bible says they were fe- they were they were afraid of the Jews, and they locked themselves up in the upper room for fear of the Jews. So it wasn't like some quick thing over with. Okay, whatever. Yeah, okay, you're on the team. You're on the team, but you're ignorant. They were afraid for their life. So we start seeing this. They were flailing. They were insecure out of being affrighted. They were insecure. They were insubordinate. They were told to go and tell his disciples. And the Bible says here, they went and told no man. They were afraid of it. Later on, we know they did go and tell. But at first, they were afraid of it. You find insubordination. They did opposite of what they were told to do. They were absent from what they were told to do. It's not that they were just, they were told, hey, go do it. They didn't like fold their arms and say no. They were, but they were ins- they were inactive from what they were told to do. They were not doing what God had commanded, what the, what the angels by God's word had commanded. Go and tell him he's, he's no longer here. He's risen, just like he said. Go and remind his disciples. Go and tell him. Go 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 out before them into Galilee. But they were absent from what they were told to do. So they, at first they want to do it out of fear. Then they chose not to do it, and they were frightened, and they didn't tell him. But later on they did. But well, they were still afraid. But you find this insubordination. There's a lot of times God tells us to do something, and we find ourselves insubordinate of that. Well, no one else is doing it. It doesn't matter if anyone else is doing it. God tells us to do something. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. I don't. God knows what you're going through, but he still tells us to go to the other side. Yeah, I just got done ministering, and just got done serving, and the 5,000 guys didn't feed themselves, and I had to, I had to hand out the baskets. Could you imagine handing out baskets to 5,000 people? 5,000 men, plus women and children. Could you imagine the scene? And then you get done after a hard day's work, and you're gonna, and I gotta collect all the fag- fragments and put them together, and then you tell me to go to the other side of the boat. And I'm going to the other side of the boat. There's a storm. You tell, what you're telling me, really? Or the Bible says they were, they're in the, they're, they're um, going, one time the Bible says they're crossing over, the wind was contrary, and they were toiling and rowing, which was right after the feet, when the feeding of the, 5,000 to 4,000. So you see, twice time that God's feeding a multitude, they have to go out there and they're toiling and rolling, and they're, they're toiling in a storm. And God sends them out, not once, but twice. Can you imagine the first time they're like, Lord, what are you doing to us? The second time, here he goes again. This is the second time, God. What are you doing to me? What, can you imagine how they're rowing, and the wind is boisterous and contrary to them? But they were in, you could, there's times that God puts us through things, and we can come out insubordinate. We just do the total opposite. Inactive, just being opposite. We're not even present in mind or present in the heart to do what God tells us. But there's flailing. Has there been a time in your life where you just find yourself not faithless, but flailing? Flailing. It's not out of it's not because you choose, it's because of the circumstances of life. And it reminds me of the parable of the sowers. The sower, the sowing the word, right? And some people, they're just tore, they're tore up by the cares of the world. They want to, they want to spring, they want to bring forth fruit, and they spring up, but there's no depth to them, and they wither. But I love this pass. I love this part about Mark chapter number sixteen. I love this, Mark sixteen. Look at verse number. We'll go to verse number 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't tell it to the ones that first believed. He told it to the ones that were hard of heart. He told them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse number 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Right? And these, after these, um, these things shall follow them that believe in my name. Shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay, um, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. 
So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up to heaven, sitting on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with, with, the, with signs following. Amen. Take your Bibles and go to John 17. This is my, this is this, this, I got to reading this past week and I got to thinking about it. And I was just trying to put it all together and I love this passage. But you remember Christ was in the garden, he was praying and he was praying, you know, sweating, uh, praying um, and sweating as it were great drops of blood. Well, while he was there, I believe this is where we find Christ actually praying the Lord's Prayer or you know, the, the, the intercessory prayer in with fervency. And I believe this is where Christ was actually doing it. We find here the Father's follow through. The Bible says in John chapter 14, I'll read the verses, but keep placing John 7 17. It says in John chapter 14, verse 13 and 14. And whatsoever. However, I'll go back and read verse number 14, verse number 12. Verily, verily, say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall do, he also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, for, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Here you find the Father's follow through. If you ask anything in my name, God's going to hear you. If you ask anything in my name, it'll be done. In my name, you're asking my authority and my place. You're asking in my name, you'll have it. It'll, it'll happen, right? But he says, greater things you'll do in my name. You're greater things you'll do because I go, right? So in John chapter 17, these, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son may also glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal and life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou hast given me to do. This is before Jesus died on the cross. This is before he was buried. This is before he rose again. But he says, I have finished it. So when Jesus says, well, it's it finished on the cross. There's no more need for any more sacrifices. He said it before, even before the cross. Because he's already purposed in his heart to get it done. It's already done, right? And it says here, I have finished the work thou hast, thou hast given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the, unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world, Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have, be and they have believed that thou didst send me. So did the disciples believe? Yes. They did. This is Christ speaking with the Father, letting them know they believe. Christ confirms their souls that they believe, right? So dispensationalists, hyper-dispensationalists can look at this passage and they can have an arguing point that no one got saved before the cross. Christ said that they believe, okay? It says here in verse number, verse number 9, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but I, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they be, may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, that um, those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture may be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world have hated them, because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but, thou, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. 
They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And again, he says it was the third or fourth time in the sense that he says it. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Again, Christ sends them into the world. He's saying this with a, with a future prophecy of presently being fulfilled. It's like it's already said and done. It's being done now, and it's going to do it later, but I've already done it. It's guaranteed. It's already being done, right? And it says in verse number 19, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they might... That, might, that they also might be sanctified through the, through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may, may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be uh, made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath, hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I declared unto them thy name, and would declare it, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou, thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. I love this passage. You find here the Father's fatherhood. Did Christ ask specifically for, for some key things in this passage? But I'm, I'm going to go down to the five things quickly before we get to the next point. But the Father's fatherhood. Jesus said, if I ask anything in my name, the Father hears it. The Bible says, I know that thou hearest me, thou hearest me always. So obviously we know this, that God, that God always hears Christ, right? So when Christ is praying something in his name, according to, glory, according to God, God follows through. That's common sense, right? Again, I'm not preaching anything new, but hey, when Jesus prayed something, it happened, right? So when Jesus prays for us back then, guess what's happening today? Exactly what Christ prayed for. Look at, verse, look at verse number 17. Sanctify them. In my name, I'm praying with the power you've given me, with the glory you've given me. All flesh is mine, right? He says that. I'm praying, verse number 17, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Clean them, Father. And guess what? God cleans us. How shall the young man cleanse his way? By taking heed, the, by taking heed unto the word of God. Right, the Word of God cleanses us on a daily on a daily basis. As we read the Word of God, even as you don't read the Word of God and you think about the Word of God, He cleanses you, He sanctifies you, He sets you apart. That's awesome. Verse number eleven. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to Thee, Holy Father. Keep through Thine own name those whom Thou hast given me, and they may be one as we are. He asked them to keep them, to protect them, to keep them, to keep them safe. To hold on to them, right? Obviously, all who come to God, he'll, all who come to Christ, will no wise cast out, right? God's not going to cast out His own. John chapter ten, there's eternal security. So He's He's God. Jesus Christ is praying for eternal security for keeping, and He does that because He is God, and God's going to honor His word. We see the Father's Father through. Verse number twenty. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Wait a second now. What word? Well, Mark, Mark chapter number 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And those that believe, <laughs> right? And those that believe. He, he goes back and talks about how they went to all the end of the world and they believed. That's us. We believe this report. So even though they were flailing and faithless, they still came to a place where they, their, their word is, is reached us. To the ends of the world, not just as far as distance, but in time. We are being reached by the word of the apostles, by the word of the disciples, that we believe their report. We believe in the resurrection of Christ. We believe in the crucif in his, his substitutionary death. We believe that, and because of that, we are also kept. But God uses them. God, Jesus asked God to use them, and guess what? God is using us today. And not in a bad way using us. He's using us. God is allowing us to serve him. 
and not only of those that not only of these, but all them that believe on them. Isn't that awesome that Jesus prayed for us and the Father follows through? Because he's, that's what he is. He follows through. Look at verse number 15. I love this. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil that protect us. That God will protect us. That God will keep us. And then when that evil that's in the world is so great and in the, in the, in the Antichrist is on the scene, we are kept from the wrath of God. And we get taken out. And God, Jesus prayed that. And guess what? We're protected from evil now. The Holy Spirit guides us and leads us. And as long as we obey him, we're kept from that evil. We're kept from despair. We're kept from ruin. As long as we're obeying the Lord, we're kept from ruin. Jesus' prayer is being answered by the Father because the Father follows through. What great comfort do we have that the prayer, Savannah, that you pray, Sean, that you pray, the, the things that you pray for in Christ's name, it happens. And the Father hears it, and he follows through. Because the Father is obligated to honor the Son. And the Son is obligated, and I use that word obligated loosely, to honor the Father. And we're, honored, we're obligated to honor the Father and the Son. And through our prayer, we pray for him he, where God is bound to answer our prayer. That's, and I'm not, that's not name it claim it. Hey, I want a Mercedes Benz, praise the Lord. No, I didn't look like it was expensive or fast. I want a BMW, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I, I mean, name it and claim it. No, we, I'm not talking about the foolishness. But as we pray according to God's word, as in, according to Christ in his name, he hears us. And we have the petitions we ask of him, First John chapter 5. Because a father follows through. That's what I'm excited about that. Verse number 24, before I get to the last point. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. What he's asking him, Father, gather them. Gather them out of the sin cursed world. When that time comes, Father, I want them here with me. Gather them. Aren't you glad this is bring comfort? Hey, that if Jesus rose, we also arise. That if Christ is risen, we shall we shall arise in Christ. In Adam we all die, in Christ we all live. He as Christ is if Christ arose, so shall I. As Christ is risen, so shall we. We're, that's a hope of the promise of this resurrection that we have, that if God rose up, the Bible says that God rose up the Father, and God has raised up Jesus, right? Acts chapter 7, that God raised up Jesus, he's also going to raise us up. And why? Because Jesus prayed it. So far, there's a pretty good track record. Nothing that Jesus prayed never happened. Nothing that Jesus, nothing that Jesus prayed for went unanswered. That's a pretty good track record to, hold, to hang our hat on. I'm pretty excited about that, right? So praise the Lord for that. Lastly, finalizing the footstool. Go back to Mark chapter number 16. And that gives me hope that the people that I lead to the Lord, they're saved just as much as I'm saved. And they're kept just as much as I'm kept. And what I, when I do the work, when I, when I serve the Lord and I, and, I, and I see people saved, and those people can see people saved, they're kept just as much as I was kept, as the apostles were kept, because they believed on Christ. That's encouraging. That, that, there's a lot of, I sat back this past week and I was like, man, I was talking to somebody, they're like, you know, so-and-so, I, we see so many people supposedly get saved and we never see them darken the doors of church. I'm like, well, I believe they're saved, I just don't believe that they're actually being, like, driven to church like maybe they just don't see the importance of church like we got to do some he's a guy i don't know i don't know if those people are gonna ever got saved i'm like i am glad that if we come if we believe on the lord he keeps us i'm glad for that i really am lastly again look at mark chapter number 16 verse number uh 15 and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned. Uh, look at verse number 19. So after, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat down on the right hand of God. It says he sat on the right hand of God. I can literally prove from Scripture that God does everything with his left hand. 
It's right there in Scripture that God does everything with his left hand. Because Jesus is sitting on his right hand. There you go. There's something new. All right? There he goes. But it says here that he sat down the right hand of God because he was sitting down. Now, this is interesting. The Bible says the earth is the Lord and, and you know, the heaven, the Psalms 110. I was going to try quoting it, and I can't. Psalms 110. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So why is Jesus sitting? Because he's waiting until he makes his enemies his footstool. So this is the finalizing of the footstool, the footstool that Jesus Christ sat down. Until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So how long is he sitting until he makes his enemies his footstool, right? Going world without end, preaching the gospel. He's making, he's making known who his enemies are, right? Sit thou here until, that's, that's, that's until an appointed time. So there's an appointed time of this. And no man knows that hour but who? My father only. No one knows at that time. So right now, the earth is the is this footstool, and we're waiting for that time. Christ sat down at the, at the right hand of the throne of God. It says that, sit thou at my right hand. When? Until I make my, thine enemies my footstool. Until, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So there's a time thing. And the footstool is being made. The footstool is being finalized. Armchair, armchair theologians will sit back and argue the validity of Christ of the scripture. They'll try to it apart, and all they're doing is proving themselves to be the enemies of God. There's people out there today who are bringing all kinds of damnable heresies, all kinds of uh, you know false gospels, and, and deceiving the hearts of many. You know what? All they're doing is they're, is they're finalizing the footstool. And we can, there's, you know, Stephen saw Jesus, Stephen saw Jesus standing at the right hand, standing, right? He saw him standing. But every other time you see this, you see Jesus at the right hand of God. You see him sitting and, and waiting until his footstool is completed. And when that footstool is complete, those enemies are made his footstool, he's sitting until that point. And then he's going to take out his footstool. And then there's no more need for a footstool. But we see that passage, and I saw it was awesome that Jesus sat at the right hand of God. And when I was reading through Psalms, I, thought, I saw that, and I kind of compared to my, Jesus is sitting until his footstool is complete. And the resurrection gives us that gives us that indication because of those who refuse to believe the, res the resurrection and to believe what Christ done through the resurrection, they're enemies. They're enemies. And the Bible says that sometimes we are enemies. He, he has made nigh, right? We've, in Ephesians, we've been made close. We've been nigh because of the blood of Christ. But you know, it's possible to be an enemy of God and then get saved. That's awesome. But there's going to come a time where that time has expired. And when he comes, he's going to take out his footstool. He's going to wipe it out. But right now, he's finalizing it. Christ is building two things right now. He's building his church, and he's building his footstool. And he's fashioning, he's finalizing his footstool. There's two things he's doing right now. Which side are we on? Which side are we busy doing? Pushing people to the footstool or pushing people to build his church? Yes, those who receive the word of God are added to the church. Those who reject the word of God, who re reject the faith, they're, they're made to the footstool. But what is our effort? What is our goal? What is our passion? Are we flailing at it? But anything that we ask in Christ's name, he has it. And I'm so glad we have a Savior who not only hears our prayer, but is also prayed ahead of time, and God heard his prayer. And it's being finalized and being followed through. That's awesome. I, I was excited about it today. So I hope that was something different for you. Um, something, not something new, but something interesting from a different angle to think about with the resurrection. Let's go ahead and uh, close in our